wild Hunting, fishing is my kind of style I plucked the white new chee when it gets hot I'm proud of all the things that I've got I'm digging in my spats up in the sand And after work a cold beer in my hand Drinking my buddy's homemade wine Living Northwest wild Hunting, fishing is my kind of style I pluck the wine new chee when it gets hot I'm proud of all the things that I've got I'm digging in my specs up in the sand And after work a cold beer in my hand Picking wild berries off God's land And drinking my buddy's homemade wine In the Northwest wild Hey, good evening and welcome Fish on Northwest Winning on Tommy Donlan Back in your center chair. That's right. Maintaining week, that six feet. Atta boy. Yeah. Week number two. Good to see you. Glad you uh, made it down here. Traffic wasn't too bad still. No. Easy peasy. Fantastic. Uh, yes, we are here. We are live. Fish on Northwest coming to you out of the uh, local studio here in Olympia and uh, so glad to bring you another live episode of Fish on Northwest. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, and I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to digging into the show, man. We we dreamt up a yeah. lot of info this week, and uh, a good number of topics to cover and plenty to do. So um, with that, want to just invite everybody and say, hey, if you got a couple minutes, go ahead and take our take our information here as the uh, the whole uh, board starts lighting up here with people joining us. Uh, share our link out there. You know what? Get it. Uh, send it to all the fishing and hunting groups. Let's get a bunch of people tuning in tonight. We got a lot of really great information to cover, and we want to share that with as many folks as we can so um with that you know we uh yeah i'm just looking at this list going holy cow I, the list, I don't know if we're going to get three. excited with that first one about the special hunt permits <laughs> before i get to that i want to remind everybody hey fish on northwest is presented by uh better homes and gardens pacific commons real estate located in Puyallup, washington and of course uh, our good buddies out there at uh, defiance marine defiance marine the uh, manufacturers of allied arima and defiance boats and i got to give them a shout out here in a little bit as we scroll through our list had a great uh you know circumstance happening out there this last week got got the boat back uh, ready to go so I'll delve into that in a second but yes uh, would you uh, anything going on this week any uh, anything happen I, I'm just really excited to have Mark Coleman back on we're gonna try to get through a full segment with yeah. him and hope we don't have technical issues yeah. he deserves that so yeah yeah looking forward to that yeah um, you know the, the first one there the special hunt permit application extension yeah I think to me that's just a reminder that now is the time to go buy a new rifle and to buy a new optic <laughs> and to start getting that thing dialed in. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's where I'm at. Are you looking at some? I, I don't think there's enough. I need to buy another safe first. Let me put it that way. You need more uh, need storage to, uh, room. Yep, bag just seen. It is buy your husband a gun month. I don't know if you guys knew that. Is that an official national or is that a Washington I, thing? I think it's a national thing. Buy your husband a gun month. Yeah. The month of May. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, All right. Well, and next month as well. Oh, it's a six week. Yeah. Kind of a mini holiday? Into, yeah, it goes into June. It's like a mancation? But you know, the thing is, is we, you know, you and I are, are the same in, the, in that we plan, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's make a plan, execute the plan. Yeah. And, you know, believe it or not, our, our hunting seasons are not that far away. You got to start thinking, <clears throat> getting prepared now, right? Yeah, get prepared. And I think the the number one thing that you can do that you can control is when you pull that trigger, putting a really good shot down range. Yeah. And so I know that, you know, my range, Tacoma Sportsman's Club, it opened back up. So it's time to get back at the bench and start putting in time, trigger time. It's, uh, you made a valid point. Hunting season will be here before we know it. And yes, the deadline for special hunt permit applications was originally going to close on May 18th, which is an easy day to remember. Mountain Day for all you who uh, <clears throat> born and raised here in the lovely state of Washington. That being said, they extended it to the 21st there, big man. That's right. A uh, few, uh, few happenings with getting the proper information out in time. They wanted to make sure everybody had ample time. Now, remember, earlier you had option put in for multi-deer, multi-elk. 
and those were awarded either you were a loser like me or you actually obtained one of those or two. What did you get? I can't remember. Any? I, you know, I just stuck with um, points only for okay. multi-season for okay. elk, but I got the deer. Yeah. Yep. So uh, now moving forward to purchase your additional applications for your selective special hunts or permits, you uh, have to at least purchase your tag, your deer tag, right? Declare which uh, which weapon you're of choice you're going to utilize. Purchase your tag. Now that being said, there will be leftover multi-season deer. Mm -hmm. They will hit the the counter on a certain date and time mm -hmm. to be announced. And when that happens, everybody feverishly shows up or gets online or whatever. To process is to try and purchase the residual last year they actually did it twice because there was still residual after the first time yeah. so it's not a uh, it's not like yeah well you have a pretty good chance of getting it if you didn't get an original draw yeah, on the get, deer side of the house. on the deer the, side, the side of the house side of the house a different story that's not going to yeah. happen so I, I wish they would do it like a gladiator event so, you know for that, for that <laughs> yeah. elk, those leftover i'm elk sure elk you elk. would yeah yeah it's then, fair, right? you're like i got a fighting chance then because yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm tommy donald i'm a gladiator <laughs> uh so you know purchase your tag put in for your six dollar and sixty cent uh extra tag whatever special hunt or whatever you want to do i threw in a number of them uh pay that little tab by the way shing and uh look forward to see if i draw any of, of those coming up but you have until the 21st to submit all that information in hopes that you're going to get drawn and uh that's just a three-day extension but if you've been dragging your feet time to get on it and uh you know good luck to you so uh moving forward hey you and i continue and along with mark coleman who will be on later on uh on the show we keep kind of regurgitating this halibut opportunity lots of uh conversation online people look Looking for a hell of an opportunity. Where and when is it? Is it happening? We're going to get a shot. Yeah. Um, the uh, the closure is at least until the end of June. Correct. Yeah. Well, yeah. So the Macaw tribe <laughs> came out and they announced that the reservation is going to be closed until June thirtieth. Um, in my mind, that that's the danger zone. We're in the danger zone now because our ocean salmon fishery up there opens June twentieth. Yeah. And you know that the state will not allow the amount of pressure that a halibut opener brings to be on top of that salmon opener. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I'm calling it the danger zone because now they're going to be looking to decouple those two things. So you're thinking they're going to be forced to, they're not going to delay salmon season, but they're, yeah. okay, so don't open halibut, just defer it to even later. Right. And there's a lot of different scenarios, but I think. Well, that that's stacks probably, it on top of tuna. Yeah, that's a problem. Like I said, I think that's a fail. Yeah. You know, as you know, a guy that just loves to chase tuna. Sure. And halibut. Yeah. Now I've got to, now I've got to basically choose one. Um, that's not going to go well. Those seasons are typically scheduled out for a reason. It gives persons opportunity. Yep. Well, first of all, the state's going to make more money. Yep. Because persons buy licensing and whatnot, and and you know they have opportunity to go after certain species on a on a calendar. Uh, now you stack them all on top of each other, or defer, as you're saying, mm -hmm. and make halibut even later. Now it starts you know, stacking on top of tuna season. We'll talk to Mark, as I mentioned, um, you know, somebody in his position. Now his his outfit, fortunately for him, unfortunately right now, but fortunately for him, he's running multiple boats. But you got charter guys that run one boat, Tommy. Right. And so they rely on halibut ling, salmon season, tuna, if they're, if they're heading way out, you know, and, and do the tuna thing. So now when you force all those stacked on top of each other and it's a Tuesday, Thursday halibut, mm -hmm. now they're now they're having to choose. They they got people that want to book salmon. You know, do I book salmon? Do I take a couple days and halibut? You know, is it fair for me to raise my price to cover excess yeah. of cost or try to make up some ground? I mean, these guys are up against it. I don't. Uh, I don't know if there's any favorable information coming out. You know, Mark indicated that <laughs> the, the frustration continues, and it's real. Yeah. The, the bottom line here is that charters and guides, even if you're a drift boat guy in a river, you're not fishing, you're not making money. You're yeah. still unemployed. You know, the, the other thing is, is that, that even in order to tuna fish, those charters have to have a six-pole salmon license. So, yeah. And those six-pole salmon licenses are, are cost prohibitive. I mean, they're... They've been selling for upwards of fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? And even the leases, if, even if you were to lease one, it, they're expensive. And so now you've got a deteriorating salmon opportunity. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're just at this point. I'm crossing my fingers for tuna. You know, and the thing that we got to remember is that it's not 
NAW and WDFW, you know, they're they're one of the pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. But the local governments have to open up the launches and the mayors of each of those those coastal cities in, into the strait, they have to be good with opening. If they say they're not good, or if the health department says, no, I'm not having it, then it's a no-go. Sure. So you've got to have that collaborative effort across all of those different stakeholders to have a season. WDFW, for the most part, would like to see us be able to go fishing. Absolutely. Especially, you know, they would like us to get on the halibut grounds. They would like us to go after deep water ling. They want to make sure they have full on, full on, full season of tuna. Do not want to have conflicting seasons. Don't want to have to choose between salmon and halibut. It's, as you mentioned, it comes down to the, the tribal lands that are in charge of those access points. It comes down to the coastal small communities and cities, the mayors, the city councils, health department. Those are the folks that when they continue to meet and have discussions, they want nothing to do with people coming out to their area. You could put in a 10 step checklist process that you have to abide by to launch your boat at Westport. And I guarantee for people to be able to go after halibut and to get on their salmon season and ultimately even go out for tuna, they're going to follow that process. Yep. This is not just a bunch of, you know, you don't have a $150,000 give or take boat and just kind of willy nilly just show up out there without your stuff. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. These are a little more uh, savvy folks who would be more than willing to follow the recommendations right. to ensure that not only do we get opportunity to get out on the water, but we maintain that opportunity to keep it open. Right. Um, so I'm not sure what the dragon of the feet is all about. I'm not no. sure what the fear is all about. Um, I don't know, but they should be opening up the communication lines with, you know, some of the, some of the, the folks in San Diego, you know, you've got a well-populated area down good there. Point. All their launches are opening back up. How about Florida? And, and yep, Florida's open. Florida's up. fishing. You know, they've never, they never shut down. No. And so, you know, how come we're not talking to some of these other states and getting a figure out, you know, try to figure out what, what are they doing that allows them to open it back up. Sure. But I'm getting a little sick to my stomach seeing all I know. bluefin pictures down in San Diego. It's killing me. It's, uh, and you know, the other thing we kind of mentioned last week too, uh, you guys all out there, general public overall, tremendously more educated on this whole deal. Recognizing safe practices, social distancing, all those things that need to be uh, sustained and adhered to. Um, you could open up access to launch your boats at these coastal communities, even if the restaurants and whatnot are not open, that would just defer folks from coming in town. They'd literally show up, launch the boat, park the truck in the huge parking lot down there. That, that whole entire Westport area has been revamped. It's, uh, there's plenty of room for folks. Um, you know, stay in your truck until it's your turn to launch. Pretty simple. Yep. And just uh, have a systematic order to it. I just am not you know, we've, we've been putting up with it for quite some time. Uh, it's time for folks to make a decision and give us opportunity to get back on the water. Yep. There's a lot at stake here. So we'll delve into that a little bit more with uh, Mark as we get into, you know, what's the status of charters and guides and the opportunity and how far out do we think that's truly going to be. So moving forward, you know, we do uh, we do have some opportunity that opened up on May 5th, obviously, right? And uh, a lot of the local lakes are uh, fishing absolutely uh, well, pretty darn good. And when trucks dump fish into lakes, yeah, <laughs> it, it tends to uh, even improve your chances that much more. So you put some halibut in there too, maybe you think? Uh, you know, no. they'd survive for you know an hour or two. Long but <laughs> the, what we can do is we can go halibut bait fishing. Yeah, there we go. That's what we're doing. We're 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 halibut bait fishing. And uh, if there's any discrepancy on that, if you still are not a believer, if you think you're breaking the law or doing something illegal, you can. Uh, recreationally go out and harvest trout and put them in your freezer and then brine them up and use them later. You're not using them as a bait in this same body of water that you caught them from. You're catching them in fresh water. It is perfectly legal to use trout, small kokanee, for halibut fishing, lingcod fishing, anything you want to do in the ocean or the Puget Sound, you can use uh, uh, recreationally caught yep. trout in, in species of, of that nature. So, and, and it's accurately stated already in the 500 page uh, WFW uh, rule book, right? If you want to read through that, yep. yeah, it's in there. But it's actually <clears throat> clearly stated. So, so uh, with that, um, this also reminds us, WFW put out a uh, post just the other day reminding folks that the season long trout derby is going to happen. It would have opened 
April 25th with the Lowland Lake opener, where then all lakes in Washington State are open for public fishing, for, well, public lakes are open for public fishing. Uh, but it has been delayed much uh, due to the, obviously, the COVID situation. So it is coming. They haven't announced an exact date. Things you need to know this year, if you are out fishing currently and you catch a trout with a tag in it, this year, 2020, the tags are yellow. Retain that tag because in the very near future, once that derby is opened up, you will be able to claim the prize that is affiliated with that tag that you pull out of that, that rainbow. So the, the lakes are stocked. They are stocked with the tagged fish for the season long derby that goes from the date that they're going to claim the derby starts all the way to October 31st. Uh, last day of uh, uh, trout fishing or lake fishing for those that are not season or for those that are seasonal, not open year round. Um, so retain those tags, and once the derby is full on, you can call the phone number. You can get on the WDFW website and find out all the information. Just simply uh, Google or type in WDFW season long trout derby or trout derby uh, for 2020, and you're going to find all the information there. So they're encouraging you to go ahead, fish, catch trout, keep your tags. The derby is coming. Date to be announced soon. Um, with that, we have four more days announced for Springer Opportunity on the Columbia. And for me, Tommy, this is a bit of a point of contention. Yeah, that's what I hear. Well, you know, it's it's once again, um, you know, our buddies up there in Idaho, uh, as you navigate your way up the river and get into Idaho, and the tributaries there for Idaho um, are struggling. And the last, uh, the last four days that the Columbia was open for folks to get after um, Spring Chinook, uh, we had uh, uh, Bill Monroe Jr. on last uh, Thursday. He gave us a fantastic report on how, just exactly how good, to his surprise as well, the Springer fishing truly was. And, uh, you know, for a couple days there with the higher flows and what they were experiencing with water conditions, the uh, the plug bite was just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. He gave us numbers that I'd never heard of before. Yeah. It was impressive. So you get done with that, they reconvene, they gauge the number of fish over the dam. They're kind of at that midway point of the run is what they're gathering right now. Um, Washington and Oregon for the lower river, um, decided that below Warrior Rock, they are going to go ahead and open it up for an additional four days. Simultaneously, the same day, in the upper river in the tributaries, um, Idaho said, we have to shut down. Yep. Um, during the last opportunity that window that was given, in Idaho, there were 18 springers caught and 11 retained. Yep. There are three hatcheries on the Clearwater that know for certain, based on run forecasts right now, run numbers, factual numbers over the dam, the pit tags that are associated with the fish that make it to those destinations in Idaho, they can look at the percentage of the return based on overall run size and say, we are not going to meet escapement. Mm -hmm. We are not going to have enough springers, spring chinook in the uh, tributaries out of, off the Clearwater uh, to meet egg take for our broodstock springer or spring chinook program, right? Or if you're Jason Humble, spring king. So uh, that's concerning. And on the on the same exact day, Washington, Oregon, and look, I want to go catch springers as much as the next guy. Um, but when we're talking about bringing fish runs back to, us, you know, trying to retain or rebuild some of these stocks, Idaho's at the, at the butt end of the deal, man. They're up there. They got to wait to see how many fish are intercepted along the way and what the total number that's finally going to make it up there. Now, if they're closed up there for conservation and we're still intercepting fish down below, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. I want us to have a springer opportunity as well, but it's just the differences of management philosophies that at times I don't understand. So do you think there was a discussion between the two states and then? Well, there was a discussion you know. between your Oregon, I'm Washington, hey, let's yeah, go right. fish. Idaho, we're, we're gonna have to close because we're not getting enough fit. Well, yeah, we're sorry to hear that. Yeah. You know, our lower tributaries seem to be doing fine, so we're gonna continue to fish. I'm just saying that it's great that we have an opportunity to go chase springers, but at what cost? You know, the upper stretches, the tributaries that dump into the upper Columbia throughout Idaho on multitude of fisheries, uh, they, they put in a lot of fish that we have opportunity on the lower river. The fall run, uh, the upper river brights that everybody is so, you know, drools over when we get that buoy 10 fishery, those fish come from upper river. That's why they call it an upper river bright. Yep. Um, the amount of effort that's put in above Bonneville to 
to you know support these fisheries in the lower stretches uh, is commendable. But then when we get into a situation where they've they've recognized we have a serious you know uh, broodstock program is 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 uh, suffering once again. And so they make the decision to close down, but yet we're going to continue to fish in the lower river. I have not seen a single person <laughs> from the Idaho area or those upper areas on the Columbia that has said, well, yeah, I mean, we get it. You guys have an opportunity to fish. So, I mean, I, that's, that's cool. No, those folks yeah. up there are pissed. Right. Once again, yeah. and rightfully so. I, I'm not sure how that decision is made. You know, there's systems in Alaska. You don't even fish until they make sure they got brood stock right. or egg take. Yep. The run has to, the forecast comes in, the run has to, you know, produce to a certain point percentage wise before they open fisheries. Yeah. Now we had two months of closure on the Columbia. And as we asked Bill last week, hey, did that have a positive effect on hopefully fish getting up river? You know, did that uh, without the, with the lack of interception of uh, recreational anglers, did we see a nice influx of fish over the dam? No. No, because you know it's all run timing. Yeah. And so right now is uh, is a time that a good percentage of that run is coming in. Again, we're you know we've been fishing, have an opportunity to fish Springer since February. We're now into mid May. We're halfway there. So there's still a good amount of fish coming in. Now, is there enough residual at the tail end of this run that the pit tags will show that Idaho is getting their fish? It's hard to say. We is, better that, hope so. is that a gamble yeah. they're willing to take? Yeah. Apparently, Washington and Oregon are. Right. Look, we live in Washington. I'm all for giving us opportunity to fish, but I get a little frustrated when our brothers and sisters in Idaho continue to take a back seat. Well, we need to make sure that opportunity is there in the future as well. Yeah, because right. if they don't get broodstock egg take and they can't contribute the amount of fish that we need to sustain these runs and give us recreational opportunity, the overall run forecast was down anyway. Yep. It was down anyway. It's it's uh, I forget where it comes in on the ten year average. I'd have to dig down number up. Maybe somebody will throw it up here. But it was down anyway. Yeah. And then we had two months where we couldn't fish. And it's not like it's you know performing so fantastic that we yeah. can uh, just go ahead and you know go after them. I, I think this is a I think this is a mistake. I think uh, we could have done without those four days. Let some of the run move through. See if we don't bump the numbers in Idaho a little bit, and then maybe. A little later, I mean, do I dare say the first week of June or something? Mm -hmm. Give us a four-day opportunity, or do they not want to cross into that so-called, you know, historical, uh, what used to be mentioned as a June hog, which no longer exists. Yeah. So, yeah, it'll be it, interesting to see how it turns out. It's just kind of a tough one. I just, I don't know, I don't know how to feel about that. So, um, other uh, concerns going along around the Pacific Northwest. Um, a young Yakima elk confirmed to have hoof disease. Yeah. Okay, so you, uh, you and I as well, uh, and many hunters in the state of Washington, and and um, some of my uh, close friends who help eradicate some of these uh, maimed uh, elk throughout season, master hunters that are called upon to put these elk down um, because of what's going on with the hoof rot. We have uh, within ten zones on the west side, eight of them are infested with hoof rot. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's concerning. And now we have a case that has reared its ugly hoof in Yakima. Yep. And this has to do with WSU and the research project that's going on and, and how they acquired this information stuff. But <clears throat> it was, uh, I read the article, I was kind of uh, curious about the extent of this thing. I reached out to Kyle Garrison, WDFW ungulate specialist, more than happy to come on the show tonight. You're pretty excited about this yeah, segment, this interview. You guys need to stay tuned and pay attention to that. Kyle is coming for, I couldn't get off the phone with him. I mean, the guy is just so ingrained into this study. Everything that's going on with WSU, truly what is at stake here, what the numbers are, What's the root cause? At the end yeah, of the day, what about. is this yeah. thing, right? Bacteria, some type of virus, is it ingested? Is it uh, transmitted you know, from feeding sites mm -hmm. like a lot of our other uh, hemorrhagic diseases and things? 
there's a gamut of diseases that hit our ungulate populations. Yep. Hoof rot in elk is one that is um, closely resembles what happens in uh, cattle herds. Mm -hmm. Okay, they have a similar type of an organism that gets in uh, within their their hooves as well. So uh, the science behind it is interesting. What the future holds to a point unknown, though they have some things they kind of understand. Interesting information, but we're going to get into that more so because. Once I read that fact that it's now on the east side, holy cow, now we're talking the entire state. By the way, it's also in Oregon. It's also in Northern California. Yeah. So for all the historical value that would indicate this is directly linked to or part of the cause is moist, wet ground, mud, uh, bacteria that lives in certain wet climates and things, they explain Northern California. And, there, and there's no cure for it. No, right? currently not. Yeah, we, we're going to need to have a discussion about chronic wasting disease, too, at some point. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's another big one yep. that started to spread. Yep. Um, maybe a topic for a future show. There was, uh, if I remember right, and if I'm wrong, a couple guys will jump on here and let us know. Steve Kramer is probably one of them. There was the first moose that... Yep. Had CWD, CWD, if I'm yep. not mistaken. Yep, you're right. Concerning because it's crossed over now to multiple species yeah. of ungulates or antlered animals, right? Yep. So kind of concerning. Um, hey, so before we jump out for a break here, uh, Tommy, big shout out to uh, Bo Palmer and the fellows out there at Defiance Marine. You know, I was having some electronic issues on my boat, uh, which caught me <clears throat> completely by surprise. I was like, what is going on? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, couldn't get it to fire up. Things weren't working right. Uh, I have minimal knowledge of electronics on vehicles and boats and stuff. I did what I could do. I, I realized I had 12.4 volts to the back of my head unit, my 7610 Garmin, right? 12.4 volts sitting in the driveway, motor's not running. This thing should be firing off. Well, the amperage wasn't getting drawn through the wires. I had some, uh, the way... Let's just say the way the previous company installed all this stuff and the way they assembled it in the back underneath by the battery and uh, the the fuses and whatnot, how they put all that in there just didn't really hold up as well as it should have. And so they took a look at that, those guys, they jumped on it, ripped it all out, changed a bunch of stuff, put a nice new battery switch in for me, which is nice to have on that boat now. And guess what? Everything's ready to go. So. Back on the Kokanee Trail for sure. On. Yeah, they helped me out today too. I don't know if I told you. You swung by so there or something. I swung by Defiance Boats, and I don't know. This is more of a sensitive subject because I have to talk about my weight a little bit. But I blew out <laughs> two pedestals in my <clears throat> captain and co-captain's chair. You? Now, personally, in all fairness, okay, the co-captain's chair went out first. Okay, okay. It wasn't me. Okay. Okay. But uh, the other one was totally my fault you know there's a little little casting in there and it's really thin and it cracks and it blows up i found out oh. so anyway <laughs> they helped me out and i got some new ones now so it was a little personal he says um you know those guys out there are great i literally dropped my boat off about 10 in the morning Bo called me by 4 p.m. said, hey, we got it figured out, installed a bunch of years, everything we did, blah, 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 it's done, come pick it up. So Perfect. Sherry and I headed out there the next day, picked it up, good to go. Um, that's why they're a sponsor on this show. They are fantastic people. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of shops you can take your boat to, and you may have to drive an extra 20 or 30 minutes to get out there towards Bremerton to Defiance Marine, but you're going to be very pleased that you did because they stand by their work and whatever they do to your boat and uh, troubleshoot problem solve preventative maintenance all of the above you're going to be very pleased with their work do us a favor here at fish on northwest if you have some issues with your boat and you know, if it's you know especially if it's within an hour's drive for you to get out to defiance marine uh, tommy and i are going to say take your boat to those guys That's for sure. let them take care of your maintenance let yeah. them take care of your issues let them take care of getting you into a new boat yeah yes <laughs> so they're going to get it done gonna, i'm going to try to tease a couple special special projects out of mark coleman tonight all right that, that defiance is doing we'll see, see if he talks about see it. if he'll bring those up yeah, okay about, yeah. sounds like a plan yeah. all right that is a uh, that was a lengthy list of items to get through but it keeps you all up to date on what's going on around the pacific northwest and beyond and hopefully you found some of that information valuable and we will delve into a couple of those topics even a little bit more as we get our guests on the phone and have these conversations so we're going to jump out for a quick break um well nope give me two minutes here before we jump out reminder of the kokanee roundup the max lure fhn kokanee roundup over there at at um, Lake Roosevelt and staying on the shores of Banks Lake at the Skydeck Hotel and the Cooley Plan Land Campground. So, 
basically with the status of where things are at in the state of Washington, referencing the opportunity to be able to go fishing, but the lack of opportunity to come together in organized groups. So I'm going to put this out there. We are going fishing. Okay. In a disorganized group. In a disorganized fashion. Okay. We are going fishing. You uh, are more than welcome to join us over there and say hi. You know, keep your distance, but join us over there at the Sky Deck Hotel or at Cooley Playland. Uh, reserve your campsite, reserve your rooms, because according to Nikki, they're starting to fill up. Um, and we will probably have a few guys in and around the area of a gazebo over there, a large gazebo, that will be talking something to do about fishing. Yeah. Okay? Probably if you ask them questions, they'd be able to answer your questions as it pertains to, say, chasing kokanee or triploids or walleye on, say, Lake Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps walleye on even Banks Lake, Tommy, you know? Yeah. So there will be some folks there that are just hanging out with us, willing to fish, and uh, enjoy our time over there. And if you have questions, they probably got answers. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you folks to uh, not wait too long. If you think you're going to go over to the east side this year and fish, you know, June 4, 5, and 6 sounds like a pretty good time to go. Uh, maybe show up over there with your boat and your significant other or family and uh, keep family in your boat and, uh, you know, come on over and have a good time. Sounds like an awesome opportunity for knowledge transfer. Knowledge transfer, uh, time on the water, yeah. time well spent, uh, a disorganized invite. That's right. Uh, not, not a group event. Not a group event and not organized yeah. uh, in, the, in the slightest. So there might even be fishing poles and gear laying around that people can yeah. just randomly pick up. <laughs> so, I mean, you know. <laughs> You're not going to have any in your boat when you come back. No, it's just going to be laying there and it might be on a table. Somebody might leave it and it, it may walk off. I don't know. So, um, with that, now we're going to jump out for a quick break. When we come back, we're going to have Mark Coleman on the phone, barring any unforeseen uh, electronical issues that we don't need. Once again, this week, got a lot of good information to get out of Mark this week, and we plan to do just that. <clears throat> when we come back, don't go anywhere. Taking a quick break. We'll be right back here on FHN. Marine is the one-stop shop for the Pacific Northwest Angler. Whether you are looking for a small skiff to fish the sound or rivers or a huge offshore tuna machine, Defiance Marine has it. At Defiance Marine, be sure to power your boat with a Honda Outboard Package. Take advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty on your Honda Outboards. Our service department is always here to help and serve you as the customer. Did you know Defiance Marine has boat financing experts to help get you the best term rates on your new boat purchase. If you need financing for that new boat, call us today. We guarantee the best price, best service on a repower for your current boat. Defiance Marine is a Honda Premier dealership and one of the largest on the West Coast. Defiance Marine also carries all the gear that you will need. Everything from auxiliary kicker motors to fishing tackle and bait. Defiance Marine has certified technicians that are top-notch at their job. Some of the best in the Pacific Northwest at evaluating your boat issues and problems. Stop in today or give us a call for all your needs at Defiance Marine. At Metal Supermarkets, we understand your need for fast access to a wide variety of metals. So we've made it easy. Our network of stores carries a wide variety of metal in all different types, shapes, sizes, and grades, with no required minimum order size. Who could ask for more? Simply tell us your dimensions online, on the phone, or in store, and we'll cut or process the metal to your desired size, often while you wait. We offer same-day service and can deliver the metal right to your door or job site. We even source hard-to-find metals, so no matter what you're looking for, metal supermarkets can provide it for you. And we're conveniently located with brick-and-mortar stores in Seattle and Portland, so you can check out our extensive stock for yourself. Superior customer service is guaranteed. Quality service from real people who know metal. We are the small quantity metal experts. To place an order, simply call a store to talk to one of our knowledgeable customer service representatives. Fill out a quote request online, order off of our e-commerce website, or visit one of our many locations and pick out the metal you want. Whether you're a small or large business, government, homeowner, or hobbyist, we make it easy for you to buy the exact metal and just the amount you need. We've been doing this for over 30 years, so we know how to get it done. Metal Supermarkets, the convenience stores for metal.
Visit or call a metal supermarket store near you today. It's easier than ever to browse homes and connect with an agent on the go with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate's mobile app. With the app, your home search is synced across all of your devices, so you can pick up your home search anytime, anywhere. Take full advantage of an enriched, mobile-optimized map search experience. Use location services to quickly find homes near you that match your search criteria. Draw your own map boundaries to find homes in a specific area, and apply layers to view school districts, neighborhoods, zip codes, and more. The app's user-friendly design makes it easier than ever to find a home you'll love. Narrow down your search results, save your search criteria, and save your favorite homes. You can browse your saved homes in a list view that puts photos and key details, like price and square footage, right at your fingertips. Or check out your saved homes displayed on the map. Hey, welcome back to Fish on Northwest. Wayne England, Tommy Donlin in studio this evening. And a, one of our favorite guests who we don't get to talk to nearly enough. And when we do try to talk to him, he just, you know, bails on us. So we, yeah. we asked him to come back this <laughs> week. <laughs> Mark Coleman, uh, so glad you could join us uh, once again. All River Saltwater Charters. Uh, you on the road on your way home or are you actually home? Uh, just taking a break on the new boat project. Yeah, uh, doing some painting tonight. We uh, we're doing the swing shift, uh, doing the painting, kind of when the crew leaves and the gotcha. Mary, 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 Mary. Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, hey, uh, we will definitely be uh, keeping an eye on that huge vessel when it's ready to hit the water and uh, plenty to talk about in that regard. But before you can even put that thing in the water and load it with people, we have to have the regulations in place that allow us to load it with people. You have some uh, you have some groundbreaking uh, basically just kind of unveiled this afternoon some new information as it pertains to guides and charters and and uh the ability to get back on the water what is what does that look like where where are we sitting with that right now as of today what was announced so the governor's office announced fishing guide operations can resume as of today in fact uh, with restrictions um ppe requirements um, sanitation protocols, things that actually a number of associations in Washington, guide charter associations worked out over the last few weeks, put it in front of the governor's office. Uh, Fish and Wildlife was involved in kind of seeing this through and a number of other uh, association members. And minutes before this call, uh, you know, I, I made my quick phone calls to see if I could gather any other data and everyone had no information for the day. And as soon as we hung up on the last call, I got an email with this, announcement saying that uh we're going to be getting eased up here and get back to get back to taking people fishing and in kind of a different way but it's a start so hey mark what, what was the indication so you guys are going to get going again you know most of the charters in westport are already in the water but some guys do trailer was there any indication of if the ramps were going to be open or where they would be open to allow charter captains that maybe have to trailer I think that was going to coincide with the ocean areas reopening for fishing. I know like the Port of Grace Harbor was um, okay with operators coming into town, you know, launching their, their boats and, and getting themselves situated on the dock and kind of doing some preseason setups. Uh, that was okay by the port, but again, fishing is still uh, closed down out there in marine areas one through four. Um, so I think leaving the marina to do anything outside of just getting you know, working through the bugs is still not going to be allowed. Okay, so you're still waiting for the official green light to do at least at a minimum some link out, link out and sea bass. In the, in the ocean areas, yeah. yeah. Puget Sound is green lighted. <clears throat> Fresh water, um, you know, the lakes and rivers are all green lighted. Um, phase one was looking like zero guided and charter activity whatsoever, but with this new announcement, you can take up to two clients per day from the same household but again that's compared to, to not being able to do it at all yeah and then and then phase two was looking like five uh total of five people on board that would include crew and now it's looking like up to eight 
um, eight passengers on board and overnight trips will be allowed in phase two. And right again, on. this comes, this comes out of this, um, safety plan that a number of these associations worked out yeah. uh, in the last couple of weeks. Is there a, uh, did you see anything that, um, outlines a date specific to phase two or when that exact drop, is there a drop dead date or is it still hinging on some additional info they're taking in under phase one? I, I read somewhere in here and we're, I'm literally looking through this here with you guys cause it's that new, yeah. um, phase one, uh, guiding two, two passengers per day, uh, basically is. Uh, authorized as of today and then phase two i saw in one of the two documents uh, uh the june 1st i saw that date i need to need to look look that up again um and it also says here that it's going to be potentially modified on a weekly basis so that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to take things away or give things give more things it, it can go either way sure so we yeah. can get more relaxed um, rules, or, or it could be tightened up if people don't play by the play by the rules as, so, as so, these uh, are outlined. So right now, if I charter on Puget Sound for lean cotton bottom fish, I'm going to be able to, to do that with two people, same household. Correct from the same household. Correct with with some PPE measures. Um, you know, they they want you to wear a mask, um, interview your passengers if they have any symptoms of flu like symptoms to uh, don't allow them to come along, um, general sanitation stuff. Um, it looks like we're gonna need to take down names and phone numbers, um, just as kind of maybe a, a tracing uh, element to this, mm -hmm. you know, which, uh, you know, there's some there's some debate on that, whether or not that's, um, you know, a violation of privacy or not, but, you know, I mean, it, uh, it coincides with the expectation on restaurants and some of the other things that they're going to start opening up, uh, name, phone number, address, email address, and that in your spot on. A lot of folks feel like this is an invasion of privacy. There's no need for them to have that information. Um, you know, for crying out loud, if they really want to know where they're at, where you're at, and if you're out, out fishing on Puget Sound, for example, uh, if you got your cell phone in your pocket, they know where you're at, you know? So right. a lot of this stuff is kind of controversial for sure. I, I think on a positive note, the fact that we're going to be able to kind of ease back into fishing sooner than later, um, you know, and as we get into phase two, for sure, the numbers of folks that can get on board now get you guys back on the water. I mean, that's encouraging. This is a really good sign. Yeah. Really good sign. Yeah. So what, uh, what are your thoughts as far as then, you know, yeah, yeah, what's it going to take for them to be convinced that things are heading in the right direction? How do we convince the tribal elders, the city councils, the mayors of these coastal regions to recognize that we are heading in the right direction and uh, it's time to open things back up and let's get some dates set for halibut. Let's get let's get folks out there and get after some shrimping in our Puget Sound waters. I mean, what do you think it's going to take? Well, we all know by you know listening to the news these days, it's it's all about the data, the science. So we do need we do need that to work in the right direction. Yep. Um, something that people can do, you know, when they travel to some of these smaller communities is just show that little bit extra amount of respect because they are visitors, um, to these places. And, you know, these, these small communities are, are a little bit, uh, scared that, you know, people are going to come out there and act recklessly and potentially spread this virus. Sure. Um, so just some common courtesy stuff, you know, in these small communities, um, treat it, treat them, you know, you're a visitor in their, in their small town, you know, so, mm -hmm. so common, common courtesy stuff, um, getting, getting the, uh, the Macaw tribe opened up, uh, looks like June 30th, that's going to be uh, a big step. I know the, the state doesn't want to open fishing in, you know, like two marine areas and have everybody go there. They right. really want to see the whole coast opened up. So. Yeah. Um, that's a new, that's a good step and yeah, just, just, you know, follow some of these guidelines. Yeah. They're, they're there for a reason. Yeah. You know? so, good point. So, yeah. so Mark, you've got a special project. <laughs> I want to sneak this in. There it comes. Um, it's kind of a, it's, it's been a fairly dark project, black program, top secret. Mm. You've got a special vessel, so to speak. Mm, in, we're talking uh, about the vessel again, aren't we? We, we are talking about the vessel. And, <clears throat> and um, you've got it in a compound. I, I won't name places. Right. But 
you know, somewhere in the vicinity of Defiance Boats also. Let me just say, the first time I walked in and saw him working on that, he popped up over the gunnel and he looked at me and goes, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> You're not supposed to see this. <laughs> that was classic yeah, Coleman. No. That was great. Yeah, you know. no, I have not left, Dwayne. I believe it. Yeah, I know. I've been sleeping there. There's like five tents right outside. You've been working yeah. there for so long. You know, eventually when you wash all that uh, fiberglass dust out of your hair and then you wash it again because it's not coming out you're gonna realize it's actually just all gray hair that's I been buried it was a white beard yeah yeah hair. yeah he's yeah. all gray he's an old man and he's he, an old he skipper forcing his wife up there on a sander sand. Can you believe that? <laughs> oh boy now anyway now i i've got a special history this with this boat you know you and i got a chance to to talk earlier today when i saw this vessel it had a a pop-out toilet you press a button and the thing is on rails and it comes out of the v-birth really you know, so you have a stand-up head it's like a little robot yeah it had cold plates in the you know in the fish boxes nice right, to keep your tune at zero yeah now mark maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you have in store for this vessel maybe just tell everybody what it is come out and, and just tell us just say it just say it this uh you must be talking about the gyro the what? Say what? The gyro. The gyro. The gyro. Yeah, he's got. He's yeah. putting the gyro on. Tell everybody what, what is a gyro. What are you talking about? Are you talking about one of those little toys that you you put on a string, you know, and you pull it and yeah, and you sit there and go like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's super size, nine thousand RPMs, and about six hundred pounds. Yeah. We the first thing we we put into this uh, build while it was still kind of the deck was still opened up was a. Uh, uh, Sea Keeper 3, which is a gyro stabilizer. It's the largest DC model uh, gyro stabilizer in that lineup. And I have not been on a boat with them. I've watched a lot of videos and, and talked it up with some people. And from what it sounds like, these things basically take the roll, take all the roll out of your, mm -hmm. your vessel out on the yeah. sea. So you're talking about less seasickness. You're talking about um, more comfortable walking around the deck. Um, sounds like a kind of a mind bender as well you know you're seeing the ocean yeah. moving around right it's not moving around so it's crazy technology you're not like yeah. Yeah. Island. i've watched the videos and i gotta tell you it's a it is a it is a mind bend if not a mind blow you kind of look at boats the same exact vessels sitting in the <laughs> same exact water next to each other one of them's getting tossed yeah. all over the place and the other one's just kind of sitting there and then even when it's up on step running man them things are just smooth and just yeah. it's unbelievable so that's pretty exciting stuff you're putting that in that huge boat of yours yeah i uh, can't wait to see how that thing performs that's now awesome you, stre you stretched it too right mark so it was stretched um, after you had fished on it. The previous owner had it lengthened five or six feet. And then after that uh, project, it never got put back out on the water, not, never got finished, and it sat for a few years. Um, through the grapevine, we found out about it, uh, pulled the trigger with the um, backing and, and the guys here at Defiance Boats to put it all back together for us. And... Um, It'll be over 40 feet when it's all said and done. Oh, right on. That is so yeah. awesome. I, I can always see it. 120 gallon bait tank. There's guys chiming in saying, I'm with Mark on that boat come August. Yeah. So right. guys are excited. Right, looking forward to it, Mark. Get out there. Yeah. Triple outboard. It's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Well, much like the uh, owner. So uh, you guys deserve each other. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> anyway, hey, buddy, appreciate you uh, taking time to jump back on with us this week. Don't, don't know what happened last week, but uh, I guess the timing was even better because you had very, very recent updated very info yeah. to a certain level. We are going uh, stampeding right into phase two, getting some folks back out on the water. And that is just really good news. I'm glad you could share that with us tonight. Thank you, guys. One more, hey, hey, Mark, I, one yeah. last question. Tommy's a little long-winded. I apologize. <laughs> Who, I, I got asked this question last week, and so I'm going to ask it to you because I think it's fair. Who is a better tuna fisherman, you or Bo Palmer, the owner of Defiance? Oh, Place? good, fair question. Yeah. Considering considering our project is still in his building and not quite done, I'm going to go with Bo. <laughs> go with Bo. <laughs> That's a really good answer. That's, That's a great a really political answer. answer. You All can right. you get that boat done, you can run All for right. office. That was perfect. Yeah. yeah. Ask, ask me in a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, buddy. Have a great evening. Say hi to Mary for us, and uh, look forward to seeing you at some point. Yep. We All appreciate right. you guys. Thanks. You bet. Bye. Take care. Yeah, that gyro. That's phenomenal. It's unbelievable. It, it's, it's, I, is it's there? There's not another boat running out of Westport with a gyro, is there? Not to my knowledge. Not that I've heard not of. To my knowledge. Okay. Yeah.
Uh, that, that boat is a specimen that is uh, going to be something to behold when you see that on the water. That's going to be pretty impressive. And, yeah. uh, you know, congratulations to Mark. He is putting so much work into this yeah. thing. It is his it is his passion. So yeah, Mark and Mary definitely deserve it. Absolutely. All right, we're going to jump out for a quick break. When we come back, you're going to be in the kitchen with Chef Kelly and Sherry for a fantastic recipe, albeit it's short, it's quick, it takes no time, and it is amazing. Okay. Uh, Thai yellow curry venison. I'm telling you, Tommy, this is a recipe that we're going to drag some of your venison or my venison out of the freezer, and we're going to make this happen because it is just that good. So uh, don't go anywhere. Stay with us through the break. Lots of you folks chiming in here. Tommy and I will try to get caught up on some of the questions and messages during the commercial break and beyond. Uh, again, we'll be in the kitchen when we return. Thai yellow curry venison right after this break right here on FHN. Allied boats are built by West Coast fishermen for West Coast fishermen. Deep V 21 degree dead rise at the transom guarantees a smooth ride no matter the conditions. Allied offers all of our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five year top to prop warranty from your Honda outboard. Allied boats range from 19 to 32 foot in length, so no matter what type of heavy gauge boat you are looking for, we have it for you. All of our Corsair 21 foot and larger designs come standard with reverse chine that is welded inside and out with no extrusions below the waterline, so that you will never have to worry about corrosion problems down the road. Get out on the water today in a boat that you can trust and enjoy with Allied Boats. Contact us at Allied Boats today to learn much more about our incredible fishing machines. Welcome back to Fish Hunt Northwest. We're here in the kitchen again with Chef Kelly for the recipe of the week. And it looks like we might have some deer meat. Am I correct? You are absolutely correct, though. Yay. Yay. So today we're <laughs> going to be making a Thai yellow curry with venison shoulder meat and some Yukon gold potatoes. Okay. Okay. It makes good use of that yeah. shoulder meat. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. A great uh, stew meat to use. Okay. And uh, so uh, speaking about that, we're going to go ahead and get that started right now. Okay, you get that going right now. Right now. Hot pan. Hot pan. Ready to go. Throwing our beautiful. It's about how much of that? This is about 12 ounces. Okay. And the reason why I picked 12 ounces was because I wanted to pick something that's going to not overcrowd. And it's also a good like two person kind of a size. There we go. I don't know if that would feed me and Dwayne, though. What? Because I eat way more than him. Huh. I would never know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, you know, just, typically meat will give off its own fat. Well, this is super lean venison, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, let it get in a good crust there. Is that your deer? Not mine. This is actually uh, Dwayne's uh, yeah. black tail, I believe. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I was testing out some this morning. I was like, uh, I hope he has some more of this. <laughs> so how long does that take on there? Nah, it wasn't like 45 seconds. I mean, see, we're getting great color. That's okay. why we start with a nice hot pan. Okay, so okay. now we can add our onion right now. All right. That's good. Oh, that's one. <laughs> Trying to get me here. That's about half of a yellow onion. Okay, okay so we're going to be making yellow curry. 
And uh, this is a, a fantastic product. I love this Mayfoy blend brand. And uh, this is a very restaurant staple right here, this brand right here. Okay. And uh, it has everything in it you need. I mean, it has uh, galango, lemongrass, shallots, curry powder, you know, turmeric. I mean, it's got everything you need. Boom. Okay. Okay. So. So I'm just going to hmm. just kind of uh, dilute it down with a little bit of uh, So you don't water. want it chunky, huh? Yeah. Awesome. We're getting a great cup. Right, yeah. Just dilute it down with a little bit of water so that I don't get any chunks in there. All righty. There we go. <laughs> okay. So add that to our, that was about a third a cup of curry paste. And you can just kind of play with it. You know, you have some experience with it. I would say that, uh, yeah, um, it would be like three out of ten on its heat level. So it's got a little spice to it. Okay. So, you know, you kind of, you're going to have to just, you know, play around with what your spice level is. Is this expensive, Chef? No, no. No, like five bucks for that. And it's, it's, oh, okay. Yeah, and, and it, it lasts a long time. Okay, so I'm adding one can. Oh, there you go. One can <laughs> <laughs> uh, full fat coconut milk. Don't full fat. Yes, don't yes. jip me on this. Mm. I know. I almost bought you the low sugar stuff, and oh my god, I, I put it back. Good, good. I heard you in my head going, <laughs> no, Sherry. <laughs> okay, you know so, better than that. So uh, we're going to let that simmer for about, oh, 45 minutes okay. uh, covered. And then we're going to add our potatoes and then cook till done. Uh, so, you know, you, you're, you don't want to add your potatoes all in one shot. I know it's, it's tempting, but if, you know, your potatoes are mush and your beef, your, your venison is, is still not done, you know, we're not doing... So you want to wait for yeah, like let's wait half on an potato. hour before you put the them minimum. in there? Yeah, then... minimum. Okay. Yeah, because I, I think I cooked that for about 45 minutes at least. Okay. So it started getting tender. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, then I added that to so it. So you already started it this yeah, morning. And I, and yeah, this morning. So I started it. And so here I already have it done. And you can see the viscosity of it. But yours may not be like this because it was kind of liquidy. So I pulled out some of those potatoes, mushed them up, threw it back in there, and I got that. Oh, so it's thicker and... Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a lot okay. more, uh, less soupy. The consistency yeah. of it is thicker. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're going to start plating. And so wow. I have some jasmine rice right here. Jasmine. Jasmine. Here you go. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Now, the only thing that you did not see me do was also put um, uh, fish sauce in it, which is very traditional. Oh yeah. Uh, with your with your curries, also some people like to put a little bit of brown sugar in theirs. It's it's all your personal taste. Okay, and okay. this, the fish sauce adds a lot of salt? Adds, or it sun adds salt, salt and a okay. little bit of, if you hear people say umami, that they umami? were- Umami? Yeah, umami okay. is, is a term. Uh, of, <laughs> you umami? Umami, no, dear God. <laughs> you ever heard of these, yeah, these guys talk about umami? <laughs> fish sauce is, is one of those umami uh, ingredients. Okay. Okay, so yeah, here's your, here's your venison uh, potato Thai yellow curry. Yeah, and you can actually see, and we'll, we'll take some of these. You can see this, it just falls apart. Oh, wow. See that? Ooh, I'm going to so. dig into that. Yes. Mm. Okay. It's delicious, too. <laughs> Licking your fingers? Yeah. Don't put them back in there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, while we dig in, we're going to go ahead and throw it back to you guys in the studio. <laughs> Hey, welcome back in studio. Uh, Tommy, that one there, 
Mm. Nothing but goodness. I know. Very, very tasty. You're a Thai curry guy, huh? Yes. Absolutely. A uh, couple things. Looking through the comments, uh, I may have offended a few folks by simply saying, look, if you're taking your expensive boat out to Westport launching, I guess my point is, if you're taking your boat over the bar at Westport, you kind of got your stuff in, in order. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, that isn't to dismiss person's ability who go out and fish the jetty, fish uh, on the beach or any type of fishing in and around the area. I'm not dismissing. Everybody's got the ability to follow the rules and do what we're supposed to do. Um, I'm pretty sure you folks that enjoy jetty fishing, which you should because it's a lot of fun, uh, can keep your six or six to ten feet away from persons, right? I say keep a fishing rod lengths away. I'm using a 10 or 11 foot rod, so, uh, you know, um, that was the intent. Just to simply say, if we're getting putting forth the effort to go fishing, pretty sure like-minded folks are going to follow the rules and do what we're supposed to do. If you bring that rod on the boat on Saturday, we're going to put you on the bow. Yeah, I'm not using a 10-foot rod on the boat. Okay, yeah, okay. So, yeah. Just making sure. Well, I mean, my downrigger rods for salmon fishing are 10-foot, right? Yeah. But yeah. Not for lingcod, no. <laughs> no, 7.5-foot rod, I'm good. Uh, along with that, hey, before we jump out for a break, I want to remind everybody, got a got a uh, communication from Larry Stamp, our buddy Larry Stamp, rods and reels in need. If you remember, for those who've been following us for quite some time, we had Larry in, oh, sometime around the summer or thereabouts he uh constantly is working very hard to gather rods and reels and fishing tackle of all walks of life new and some used and uh, pulls that all together via donations and persons donating money so they go purchase new gear uh let's face it tommy with the economy right now and persons out of work uh maybe this is the year you were going to buy your son or daughter grandchild uh first fishing rod and reel and tackle and everything want to take the kids fishing um but aren't in a position to do so because of finances Contact Larry Stamp. Write down this number, 360-456-2767. Or if you're on social media, go to Facebook, look up Rods and Reels in Need, and you'll be able to contact Larry via his information there. Very good nonprofit organization. He does tremendous things in the community. If you have relatives who are out of this immediate area, uh, as in the west side of Washington or Olympia area, uh, go ahead and reach out, contact Larry. Anyway, he has a network of folks that he can branch out to and get things delivered to folks that might be on the other side of the state or maybe even down in Oregon. Uh, things like that can happen. So he's a very good gentleman, uh, big heart, looking to just try and, you know, help folks out, especially during these trying times. Check it out, Rods and Reels and Needs. He has a surplus of equipment right now on hand. He needs to get rid of to those families and kids in need. So uh, look him up and give him a call. All right, with that, we're gonna jump out for a break. We come back, Kyle Garrison, WDFW Ungulate Specialist. We're gonna delve into this uh, hoof rot ordeal, kind of really break it down, get to the science behind it, what's truly going on. Yes, we're gonna talk about the impacts of, uh, of spraying the private timber company and their their spraying practices on their uh, timber timber stands and what that cause or effect has to do if anything with hoof rot there are those that think it has a tremendous amount to do um, and we're gonna we're gonna walk through all that process and you know this will be a good 15 or so minute interview but if you guys continue with the questions I'll just keep Kyle on the phone longer because yeah. uh, we're on our time Tommy wealth of information. yes wealth of information so don't go anywhere invite your friends send this out to all your hunting groups right now so when we come back from break we got a good amount of people that are tuned in to listen to what kyle garrison has to say wdfw ungulate specialist we're going to delve into the hoof rod ordeal right after this break right here on fhn a northwest favorite for almost 40 years arima boats are manufactured with pride right here in bremerton washington arima boats offers all of our boats with honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your honda outboard with literally thousands of arima boats on the water throughout the pacific northwest arima boats are a proven hull design that offers incredible fuel economy and all of the amenities that a serious angler is looking for all Arima boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why we back our boats with a lifetime warranty. All of our Arima boats are designed to maximize deck space while also providing ample seating. Contact us today at Arima Boats for all your boating needs and let us help you get out on the water.
Hey, welcome back in studio to Wayne England. Tommy Donlin here this evening, and uh, well, here every Thursday, actually, Tommy, huh? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Had a kid. Um, on the phone with us, first time, uh, long time follower, first time caller. Can we say that? <laughs> Kyle's like, who are you? What do you call me for? Um, Kyle Garrison, WDFW ungulate specialist, and there was an article posted this last week that they've now observed uh, first case of hoof rot, Tommy, in Yakima, which is concerning because we're familiar with it here on the west side, and now it seems like it's crept over the Cascades and kind of landing there on the east side along with the WSU uh, project that's going on in research. Uh, first of all, Kyle, thanks for taking the time this evening and welcome to FHN. Well, happy to be here and uh, thank you for bringing me along on the show. Yeah. The news. yeah, absolutely. So I guess let's start with some of the history be behind hoof rot here on the west side where a majority of folks are more than likely um, kind of in tune as to what's going on, but let's let's kind of delve into it a little bit as far as when did it rear its ugly head? Really, what is it? You know, what's the genetic makeup of this thing? Is it a, um, is it a bacteria? Is it a virus? And uh, how prevalent is it here on the west side and where, where are we finding it? Yeah, well, let's jump right in. So um, the, the disease's technical name, its scientific name is, is known as treponeme-associated hoof disease. And the disease, as that name would imply, um, this treponeme-associated part, there's a, there's a bacterial pathogen, a type of bacteria known as treponemes. These are these strange-looking, spiral, cork-shaped-looking bacteria. Um, that's sort of their mode of action. And uh, there are multiple species of, of treponemes which are involved in this disease. But um, treponemes seem to have a major role. They're there during all stages of this disease. And they, they certainly have some form of a causal role. So uh, we first started seeing this disease on the landscape. And I should sort of back up maybe and say that this is really a, an unprecedented disease when it emerged. It still remains a, a, an unprecedented disease in that we've never documented anything like this in elk or any other free-ranging ungulate. There are similar diseases that we found in domestic livestock, notably in dairy cattle, but <clears throat> never before in elk. There are other diseases of elk that look similar, um, things like classic hoof rot, and a lot of folks use the hoof rot and, and you know they interchange hoof disease rot. You know, the technical side of things, there are some some 
nitty gritty details which would differentiate these diseases, the types of bacteria which are involved. But um, ultimately, you know, things like hoof rot or laminitis or other injuries can cause hoof ailments, they can cause limping, they can cause lameness and overgrown hooves and even sloughing of the hoof itself much like what we see with this treponeme associated hoof disease. And I'll probably just call this hoof disease for the rest of the show. Okay. But um, when we first started seeing this disease was in Southwestern Washington, uh, the original sort of emergence of this disease is hard to pinpoint. If you talk to folks in Southwestern Washington, folks that have been beating the bushes, been hunting, they tell you that they started probably seeing limping elk and they heard about reports of limping elk around the late 90s and, and into the early 2000s. And certainly by the mid 2000s, there were sporadic cases of limping elk, elk with uh, you know elongated hooves or broken hooves or rotting hooves, elk that are lame, unable to get up, that were starting to creep up and starting to get on our radar. But these were really sporadic in nature, not a lot of them, and they were pretty. Uh oh, did we lose you? I think we just dropped Kyle. There we go. Oh, there you and, go. <laughs> sorry, we lost you for a little bit. So whatever you're doing, don't move. <laughs> so, oh, okay. You, oh, sorry about that. Yeah. So what'd you hear last? So, so the, the disease originated, we think, in the Boisfort Valley. Okay. Uh, that's that's the Willapaw Hills elk herd area. Mm -hmm. And that by certainly by the mid 2000s, the disease is on the landscape and and becoming established in that elk population. Okay. Now, as we moved later. Interestingly, in, this, in 2008, we had this really rapid expansion of the geographical distribution of this disease. We went through the Willapaw Hills elk herd. More animals started to become reported and, and infected. And that's about, you know, really when we knew this was, okay, this is, this is something new. This isn't just classic hoof rot or laminitis or something else that we could explain this. This is clearly something else. And when we started to look closer, we couldn't really identify this disease and knew that this was gonna, this was a new disease. This is something that had just emerged into elk and would require new diagnostic research. And so we took a number of years to do that. We had several collaborators, external researchers, wildlife veterinarians, animal disease experts, and they helped us over a number of years diagnose this disease. And that's where we found these treponemes, among other bacteria, in these infected elk hooves, but never in uninf uninfected elk hooves. And the bacterial profile that we find in elk is a very, very similar, if not indistinguishable profile that we find in a disease of domestic livestock called digital dermatitis. Huh. And so as, you, as you all know, you folks in Western Washington, by 2014, this disease had become very firmly established and at a high level of prevalence in the Mount St. Helens elk herd. When it got over I-5, it really swept through that population like wildfire. And we saw, you know, groups of elk where, you know, among, among groups, we were seeing 70, 80% of groups that had a limping elk in it. Prevalence is a difficult thing to, to estimate, but we've certainly, we, we've used a number of different tools, but based on hunter reporting, a few years back in the core of Mount St. Helens, we had the highest prevalence rates. About 40% of hunters that harvested milk reported to us that they found some abnormality in the hooves of their elk. Hmm. So those are unverified, but that's a pretty good feel for what we were dealing with. That's and really pretty, high pretty, pretty high percentage too. Tommy, you were saying? Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about this bacteria and, and what we know about the bacteria itself. And is it, is it found anywhere else in the world? Yeah, well, yeah, so treponemes are very, very common type mm -hmm. of bacteria, of course, and much like, you know, other, you know, the, the treponeme is the genus of bacteria, and so there are a lot of bacteria, there are a lot of species of treponemes which probably are non-pathogenic and don't cause disease normally, but the particular phylotypes that we find, these groupings of treponemes that we find in host disease of elk, um, they are, like I said, indistinguishable from the, the bacteria that cause a disease in the livestock. And so I would say that they're fairly ubiquitous across uh, anywhere where there's certainly dairy cattle. You know, the disease in dairy cattle emerged in Europe in the 70s. And by the 90s, it had gone and gotten into the United States and North American dairy system. And it swept through that system pretty quickly. 
So it's safe to say that trep memes themselves are probably present in a lot of areas of North America. How does now, it? Uh, how does it actually get into the hoof? And 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 then you know the problems that it creates. Obviously, the the weird growth of the uh, elongated mm-hmm. hooves, the separation, the uh, ultimately on some of them, the the actual hoof will just fall off the end of their the end of their leg, mm-hmm. and they're o- left with an open you know stub wound that is mm-hmm. uh, will ultimately uh, land their demise at some point. So how does it get into the hoof, Kyle? That's what I really that's what I really want to know on this little critter. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. It's a it's a question we don't have a perfect answer to, but I'll offer what's uh, sort of the best available sign. The earliest stages of this disease, they develop as a lesion either in between the hoof claws themselves or along the coronary band, which is where the hoof meets the skin. Right now, that initiating moment, uh, you know, it, it it may require other bacteria, which causes it creates a sort of microclimate for other bacteria, which they can then invade. It also might be contributed to by degrading of the, of the skin tissues themselves. You know, we often find this disease most closely associated with wet, moist conditions. It's thought that those moist conditions, by standing around and loafing around in the, in, in the wet, moist soils for a long period of time, may weaken those skin tissues and allow bacteria to invade when they otherwise might not. And also, uh, for those of you that have hiked around Western Washington, have hunted elk in Western Washington, spent some time in clear cuts, you know there's a lot of slash and a lot of things that can penetrate the hoof tissues, those skin tissues. It's possible that that creates the uh, opportunity for these bacteria to invade when they otherwise wouldn't be able to do so. Gotcha. And, and once, that, once that lesion progresses, once that infection begins, it usually is a one-way street, and it advances, it undermines those hoof tissues, and it gets inside the hoof capsule itself, at which point now we see the, the degrading of the tissues, that necrosis of the tissue, the overgrowing of the hoof claw itself, which leads to this cracking and breaking, and ultimately, like you said, those hoof capsules can slough off completely and leave you know, really no hoof at all, except for like a stump. So it needs a pathway of, you know, broken tissue or skin or an opening, kind of like, I think I mentioned it to you the other day, and my, my thought is like on a human, you know, a scratch or some type of uh, slight injury of the, even the slightest injury, and it just has to be the right circumstances and the right, you know, everything has to come together, but folks then that are subjected to uh, flesh-eating bacteria, it starts with a very minor uh, pathway to allow that bacteria to get in, and once it gets a hold, it uh, does its damage. So what about the uh, thought process as far as, you know, the private timber companies uh, spraying uh, the herbicides and, and different chemicals on the landscape to uh, minimize the growth of the types of trees that they don't want uh, simply because they are, you know, they're in, they're in the business of growing timber and it's a marketable commodity. They don't want it being overrun by all the other reprod of things that can grow. So they spray the herbicides and not how much does that affect if any or is there signs that would indicate it may have some effect on uh helping perpetuate or even in fact cause hoof rot yeah this is a really good question because it's a very commonly uh thought of uh, possible explanation as the cause of this disease and it's really understandable because when you know you go out there you see these clear cuts that have been treated by herbicides and it's really dramatic and of course, we know you know there's there's more and more research around Roundup and you know different various herbicides, and it raises eyebrows and it raises questions. What role does this have? And what I can tell you is that to date, there's there's no evidence that would suggest that there's a direct sort of proximate chemical toxic cause for this disease. And and what you would expect, like some sort of chemical burn or something, say that a, a clear cut has been sprayed with herbicides and elk walks through it and it gets it on its hooves, and that then allows some bacteria. There's just been no evidence of that. You know, we've sent a lot of hooves to a lot of different pathologists, a lot of different diagnostic laboratories, and they've always come back to show that this is an infectious disease caused by pathogenic bacteria. Now, what should be noted, of course, is that there are other, you know, there are factors which play roles in indirect ways. And what we don't really have a a good answer to, because it's very plausible that, you know, habitat and nutrition are playing an important role in the susceptibility of this disease. And, of course, we know that herbicides, like you mentioned, they're targeting species of plants which compete with trees for timber companies. 
those species of plants that they're targeting are forage species for elk. And so there's a possibility that there's playing some sort of dynamic role in the forage base for elk, which has a role in the nutritional status of an animal and therefore its susceptibility to the disease. But those are links that you really have to patch together. They're hard to tease apart. And the bottom line is, is that while nutrition probably very much plays a role in Western Washington in this disease, that the role of herbicides is very complicated in determining the amount of nutrition and forage that's available on the landscape. And it isn't clear cut that, you know, no pun intended, yeah. that herbicides <laughs> actually reduce over the long term, actually reduce the amount of forage that's available because this is a moving window. It's a mosaic out there. There's a right. lot of different ages of clear cut. And we really rely on those clear cuts out there for elk for it. So yeah, um, I would caution mm-hmm. folks to, to, to stay apprised of the research that's going on with not only what we've done, but with also WSU. Um, and that, you know, like I say, there's there's really no evidence that a direct cause of herbicides is a, playing a role in this disease. Well, that, that's good news in a way. Sure. So we've got uh, our viewers are chiming in. They've got some questions, Kyle. And one of the okay. questions that, that is coming up repeatedly, and I think we ask it is, you know, talk to us about a cure. What, is, what does that look like? What types of things are we trying? Yeah, yeah. So cure, it's a, that's a, another tough one, right? I wish I had yeah. a, little, a, a little vial of something that I could, you know, administer. So when you were talking about wildlife disease, just in general, you know, not just elk hoof disease, I mean, there's really a small toolkit out there because as you can imagine, you know, vaccines and treatments that would target these bacteria or whatever pathogen it might be in order to interrupt the either the vulnerability, the susceptibility of an animal or its ability to transmit this disease. You know, those just really aren't out there. Um, there's no vaccine that's available for this type of disease that we see in domestic livestock. And there's certainly not a, a mm. vaccine that's available for elk. And even if there was, you can imagine administering a vaccine to a population of elk free ranging Western Washington with that canopy cover and trying to figure out that that's really out of bounds of what's really sure. actually practical. Right. Right. I've got, I've got and, quite and, the hunting crew, Kyle. I think we could sign up. For that. <laughs> we could, <laughs> we could bag and tag and uh, give, yeah. give uh, doses of shots. Yeah. And so the other <laughs> thing that people really want to know is, okay, so you got a herd and, and one elk has it. Okay. Now can that one elk, because they're milling around in the same area, is, is it likely or have you guys noted or seen that one individual pass it to the other parts of the herd? Yeah, I mean, we've not documented a, a direct, you know, sort of transmission of the disease. That's really something we're gonna have to have happen in captivity. And of course, we, we know Washington State University has got this state-of-the-art captive facility and that's some of the work that we're gonna work with them to try to get them out to, mm. to actually see that in hand. But what I can tell you is that it's almost certainly a transmissible disease where one elk is sick. It's got the, these pathogens on its hoof. It deposits these pathogens into the environment and another animal then comes and picks it up. And that's based on the science that's coming out of domestic livestock. And they put a lot of money in research and they've had several decades more lead time in researching this in domestic livestock situations. So we borrow some information about how this disease probably works to formulate some of those hypotheses. But that's probably how it works. And, and based on how we've seen the disease radiate out from kind of a core area, Mount St. Helens, at least in those early days, that would be indicative of a disease that's transmissible and it's it's moving from elk to elk, more than likely coming through the environment. Gotcha. Uh, knowing the elk populations as we do, let's talk specifically to the west side. Um, do you guys have an overall understanding or guesstimate of what percentage of elk are or have been infected or are infected with, with hoof rot uh, currently? Well, it's a good question. I mentioned a little bit earlier about some prevalence information. and I can tell you that where the disease is most common um, in the core units of Mount St. Helens, mm-hmm. that, that core area, back in 2016, we had hunters reporting, 40% of hunters reporting that they found yeah. an abnormality in their elk hooves. We've seen that go down to, from the 2019 license year, this just past license year, to about 26% of hunters reporting that. So you're that's ta- an encouraging sign. You're talking about harvested animals? Harvested animals. Yeah, okay. And so that's a, that's a rough index of what's out there. Right. In the past, we've used aerial surveys to um, also ascertain some, some group-level prevalence. 
there's some sort of, you know, some, some mathematics and some, you know, limitations in kind of the comparison, but that kind of tells you the same story as well. And those numbers are pretty out of date. It's been about three or four years since we've done those surveys. Okay. But I can tell you from Hunter reporting, about 12% on the west side across the board. Okay. Um, and again, highest in the mountain homes are popular. Yeah. But definitely keeping an eye on it. And with the, uh, with the um, program now being run out of WSU and the expansion and the research project and the funds to continue that process, uh, hopefully good things to come with that, working with WDFW and folks like yourself to keep, uh, keep on top of this thing so it doesn't get completely out of control and wipe out our elk herds. Well, that's right. Yeah, we're really encouraged by the amount of research that's going into this. We've got a lot of uh, good work going into this, a lot of effort, um, and we're hoping to really come together and find some manageable management solutions to get a handle on some of these more affected elk populations and also keep our eye on areas where the disease is emerging and be ready to manage it when it's, when it's um, popping up in other areas. Right. Right. Well, uh, fantastic info, Kyle. So glad you were able to take some time with us tonight. Very educational. Uh, don't be a stranger. You are the WDFW recognized ungulate specialist. So we have plenty of ungulate questions and topics to speak of. One that is on the minds of many is the correlation relationship between predation, i.e. wolves in the northeast quadrant of our state and the ungulate populations. And I know you can't wait to join us in studio and we can sit down and have a very candid conversation on the true numbers and what that looks like and the research project that is year three of five if i understand it correctly uh and what types of numbers that that is currently producing so really look forward to that stuff in the future yeah let's get together and chat it out awesome man appreciate it have a great evening uh, don't be a stranger thanks Kyle. thanks gentlemen Take all care. right there you go kyle garrison wdfw ungulate specialist and more than happy to come forth with information not holding anything back as we started going down the rabbit hole of wolves tommy i'm telling you this guy cannot wait to talk about what truly is going on there and i know a lot of you that follow us week in and week out and when we had julia smith in here and, and dedicated two hours to the uh, a actual overall wolf management plan as it stands today currently here in washington state um very educational and and you know how it started where it's at how much impact it's having um she could only go into so much detail in that regard people really want to know what's going on as it is a predator prey relationship and what what effect it's having on the landscape kyle is the man we will get him in here i guarantee it well it, it just you know you think of all the things that these elk have to go through and it's almost like an uphill battle you know you've got the hoof rot yep. hoof disease yep. you've got chronic wasting disease yep. you've got wolves you've got cougars I mean, you got man. It's amazing, right? right. You got uh, the urban sprawl. Yep. That's consuming the landscape, habitat degradation. Uh, it, it, the list is yep. on and on. I mean, uh, you know, we will continue to follow uh, predator prey relationships as it relates to not only wolves, but uh, with uh, bears and in, 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 uh, mountain lions as well. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a changed uh, <laughs> it's a changed uh, wildlife. Um, living condition out there once we remove the use of hounds for hunting certain predators in the state of washington yeah. almost 20 years ago yeah the population is blown up mm -hmm. and mountain lions as well so uh okay with that ran a little long but that's okay good information from kyle garrison and we plan to have him back on down the uh down the road near distant future with that we are going to now do a flip here. We get got to get back into talking some fishing here, Tommy. Yeah. And uh, kokanee is on the minds of many. And I can tell you kind of a global report that kokanee fishing is doing exactly what kokanee fishing should be doing, and it is on and off. Now, we had some really nice weather last week, mid-80s, uncharacteristic of, uh, you know, early May. Um, but it was fantastic weather. A lot of folks are out on the water finding some good, some moderate success as it pertains to kokanee and trout fishing. Kokanee and a number of lakes on the west side let's face it when that water warms up uh, based on these 85 degree days we get that water temperature uh, up over 60 degrees surface temperature kokanee began to get a little active so some lakes were fishing pretty well some lakes were fishing like typical uh, kokanee lakes we had that pressure system move in uh, Monday we had that rain come in we had that complete 
change, 15 to 20 degree temperature drop, and a little bit of rain, a little bit of wind. Um, basically, a low pressure moved in, and when that barometer drops, guess what? Coconut salmon. And uh, my theory is fish with bladders, which is pretty much all bony fish, uh, trout, salmon, and whatnot. Um, yeah, I found out perch and uh, walleye don't have a esophageal type bladder that they can burp out of. So, yeah, you know, so they're not the ones uh, leaving burps in the in the lake, okay? <laughs> it's all the other ones. But that being said, these fish are affected by barometric pressure change. We had a significant one, and I can tell you Monday when I went out for a few hours before going to drop the boat off, um, the kokanee bite was non-existent. Mm. It was a 180, man. Somebody flipped a switch and them buggers were not biting. So we're getting a little stable weather now. Going to have a little barometer level off going to kind of be consistent on our weather condition, which is exactly what we need multiple days. Water temperature held uh, held in check. A number of your lakes that you've been fishing uh, here on the west side and had been producing might start creeping back up to better results. So with that, we want to get you ready for kokanee fishing, especially if you're just venturing into it, deciding to dip the old toe in the kokanee pool and uh, want to get out there and do some things. Well, I'm going to go through some gear basics, rods and reels, line counters or not. I'm going to talk a little bit about scents, baits, dodger configuration, lengths of leaders, some basic lures, kind of get you set, give you a visual give you a visual simulation of what it looks like to be a kokanee fisherman or lady and uh, how to get geared up, some things you should think about before you go to the sporting goods store and spend a bunch of money. Let's know what you're, uh, what you're going to spend your money on and let's get you set up to uh, be successful. So we'll jump out for a quick break. We come back, we'll do some kokanee basics in the bait lab uh, right here on FHN. Defines boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why we back our boats with a lifetime warranty. All of our Defines boats come standard with large fish boxes that are fully insulated so that you can ice your fish properly all day. Defines boats feature a 21 to 22 degree dead rise at the transom and a large reverse chine for incredible handling and stability offshore. Defiance boats are foam flotation filled and unsinkable for the ultimate in safety while fishing offshore. Defiance boats feature fuel efficient hull designs with large fuel tank capacity so that you can have maximum fuel range for making long offshore runs completely safe and affordable. All Defiance boats come standard with self bailing decks for improved safety while at sea. Defines Boat offers all our boats with Honda Outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your Honda Outboard. Defines Boats for all your boating needs and let us help you get out on the water.
Hey, welcome back to Fish on Northwest. We are now obviously in the bait lab with this week's uh, how-to. Uh, How-to's in the bait lab, always brought to you by Max Lure. Check out everything Max Lure has to offer. Just simply go to maxlure.com. You're gonna find a lot of the stuff that is sitting here on the table and that we talk about often uh, with uh, segments here in the bait lab. So. Basic uh, kokanee or kokanee basics as they were. Uh, a lot of things here on the table this evening. We're going to kind of get through a handful of them. And you know, uh, when it comes to outfitting yourself or equipping yourself with proper gear to be successful for kokanee, one thing we have to remember is they have really soft mouths. Okay, it's not like trout to where you can be trolling along at 1, 1 1.2, 1.4 miles per hour, and uh, it's like a rail car coming by and you just reach out and grab a handle and it doesn't put the brakes on, it just keeps going at the speed. So you're going along for a ride. Well, with trout, no big deal. You can tow them around for quite a while because they got a nice uh, bone structure in their jaw. Kokanee, extremely soft mouth. And depending on how you're set up and what's going on, you can not only hook them up, but you can rip it right out of their mouth instantly if you're not set uh, for success. So one thing we definitely want to do is key in on utilizing kokanee rods for kokanee fish. And the parabolic bend in these soft rods is what allows you to hook up and play a kokanee to uh, to the boat, in into the net, be successful in your catch because of how much forgiveness these rods have, the soft tips. And generally on the, on the uh, you know, good kokanee rod is gonna be from about the first eye to the tip is gonna have a lot of parabolic bend, a lot of forgiveness in the rod. You're gonna have a little bit of stiffness uh, at this lower section from the first eye down to the reel seat is where you get the backbone on the rod to, to you know, actually on your bigger fish, move them around to where you want them to go. So. Do I have to break the bank to find a good kokanee rod? Not necessarily. These yellow eagle claw rods have been around for a few years now. In most retail locations, you can find these things from anywhere from you know 20 to 24, 24.95 for a kokanee rod. It's unbelievable how uh, uh, affordable these rods are. And you know the cool thing is they even put a measuring tape here, Tommy, right along. <laughs> it's like a yellow measuring tape on their yellow rod, yeah, so you can measure the length of your fish. So very economic rod this eagle claw and you know when it comes to kokanee fishing there's some things that are you kind of need to know to be successful one troll speed is something you're in control of depth that you're fishing you know good electronics to give you speed and depth marking fish sonar mapping to follow contour lines uh, understand the layout of your lake and all those things are important but also not not only just depth of presentation but your setback okay you just don't want to kind of willy-nilly it just let a bunch of line out drop it in the rod holder and call it good when you're putting out a set of rods you want to kind of be in the ballpark, similar same distance, and it varies depending on water clarity, depth you're fishing, all those types of things. Oftentimes I will fish anywhere from 75, 80 to 100 feet behind the boat. Uh, for me personally, that's simply due to adjustability when I go over a school of fish and I'm either uh, dragging my presentation in a level of water, water column that they are above or below my presentation. I see those fish or that school of fish on my electronics. I have time to adjust up or down with my presentation by having a 100 foot setback. If I'm fishing short, if I'm only 25 feet out behind the boat, I go over those fish, I probably don't have any adjustment time to uh, move my gear that's going to be beneficial in uh, hooking up any of those fish. So setback is important. Now, uh, line counter reels are more expensive than reels with no line counters, but if it's what I can afford, I'm going to spend 25 bucks on a rod, I'm going to spend 50 bucks on a reel, I'm set up to go kokanee fishing. One thing that works well is you take these Dacron uh, bobber stops, okay, and simply by tying these bobber stops on my line, now this one is simply right here towards the end of the line so you can see it, but I'm going to basically take this and slide it up the line. I'm going to measure out uh, yards or feet of line. I'm going to put one of these at 50 feet. I'm going to probably put one if I have a different color like the pink versus the green. I'll put the pink at 75 and I'll put another green one at 100. Thereby as I let the line off of my reel, I will know as I let the line out that I am at 75 or 50, 75 and 100 feet on my setback. Um, and if I, if this is my rig that I'm running on multiple rods, just the same exact set up I will put those flags on every rod so that my distance is similar same or equal on every presentation I'm putting in the water so you don't have to break the bank on that 
by buying the high dollar end reels with line counters, you can put markers on your line to get that done. Another great choice is this Lama Glass 8 foot. That Eagle Claw is an 8 foot two piece rod, uh, line weight of uh, 4 to 8. Now this Lama Glass rod, this is an old school, this white and red wrapped rod has been around for a long time, it's an 8 foot two piece, 2 to 8 pound, very forgiving rod, very lightweight. You're going to spend about 79 to 85 bucks on a rod like this, which is well worth it. It's a really good rod. Uh, many persons have brought plenty of kokanee to hand with this exact rod. You're going to find these eyes on this rod, particularly towards the tip, are very small. can barely pass a knot through them. But besides that, um, it's a great rod. I love fishing these rods. They're lightweight, a lot of fun to get the bigger fish on. They couple that with an Abu Garcia 5500 series with a mechanical line counter, okay? So something. And we have a choice here, and I'll show you. We have digital or mechanical. These mechanical ones tend to last for a long time. You don't have to worry about replacing batteries. Not going to break the bank. Very economical. This setup right here is not going to, you know, uh, cause you to mortgage the house. You get two or three of these in your boat, you're you're in business. Lamb glass rod, the Sabo Garcia 5500 with the mechanical line counter. It's going to do you uh, for years. Uh, low maintenance, very uh, reasonably priced, and we'll get the job done. Another option is this eight foot uh, feather six rods that you can no longer get unless you find them on sale somewhere because they quit making them. But this is a one piece eight foot rod, four to eight pound. Love these rods just because of the parabolic bend and how forgiving the tips are. And again, from the first eye back to the real seat is where the backbone of this rod is. And even fishing those bigger fish over in Roosevelt, get some big triploids on there. Last year, Barnum and I used these rods exclusively over there at Twin Lakes for them big four to six pound triploids. Great rod, works really well. If you can find them, I highly recommend you, you know, get your hands on these, go ahead and pay what you have to because you won't be disappointed. This has that Daiwa AccuDepth reel with a, a digital line counter. Now, the only thing about digital line counters is you may have to replace the battery at times. And for these specifically, you got to send them into a factory or a factory location to have them change your batteries out. But I can tell you, I've had these reels for five or six years, have yet to put batteries in. Pretty sure a number of you guys are going to say, well, get ready because it's coming this season. You're going to have to replace the batteries. But a nice low profile. I'll set up very light, run 10 pound mono on these all day long, does a great job, even for bigger fish. You can uh, fish in Brewster. When you're over there fishing sockeye for Brewster, um, you, you know, land Chinook on these rods, no problem. Just got to know how to play a fish. Uh, have landed many 15 pound Chinook on these kokanee rods when you're over there in the Brewster pool. So. Just some options, whether you go with line counters or not, however much you want to spend on a rod, it can be anywhere from, you know, again, 24 bucks all the way up through 100, 125, 150 bucks, depending if you're talking graphite handles, cork handles, that type of thing. Uh, plenty of retail outlets have a variety to choose from. Don't use your trout rods. Spend a little money, get a kokanee rod, your success rate's gonna go up extensively. Now, let's talk about presentation. I got my rod and reel, and I have a whole bunch of options here. And we're gonna get into bait and scent and all that in a little bit, but you know, I got a number of lures here that I've tied. Last week we talked about uh, or two, well, two weeks ago, I guess we talked about a number of options that Max Lure has. You know, the Wiggle Hoochies are very popular. They come in a variety of colors. They're fluorescent and or UV. Got a UV bill on them. They work fantastic. Uh, typically on these types of lures, these bigger lures, this is, okay, a Wiggle Hoochie. It comes with a three foot leader, but uh, I will cut that back to no more than 20 to 24 inches. Now, I'm running that with a bigger Dodger presentation. It's a bigger lure. It's got a lot of action on it. Uh, because it imparts so much action on its own with this bill, I'm gonna run that further away from my Dodger. Okay, remember, the less action the lure itself imparts on itself, the closer you need to run it to your Dodger because the Dodger is providing the action. These Wiggle Hoochies move around a bunch on their own, so I can put them behind the Dodger quite a bit further, upwards of two feet. I don't run them out three feet. Uh, they give you that option. I like to cut it back to 20 to 24 inches max. Now, early morning, low light, conditions that warrant a lot of flash, I'm gonna run a larger Dodger in a big profile lure to draw a lot of attention. Now, looking at the table here, I got some options and uh, differences in, in uh, Dodger size, colors, and um, contrast. And also couple that with different leader lengths depending on how much action the lure imparts on itself. One thing I want to point about 
these newer sling blades with these multiple uh, UV colors, the back side is actually glow. So we have the option of glow on the back side of these. This is a great early morning, late evening, low light condition, cloudy day. Uh, when you want to have UV and glow working to your advantage, go ahead and find some of these new uh, products out by Max Lure, formerly uh, the Sling Blade series that has, or is still currently Sling Blade, but it has glow on the back side, something to think about. If you look at the length of leaders here, Typically with these bigger lures uh, with some type of spinner on there, this has a spin and glow. This one here has a smile blade. These are typically 13 to uh, 14 inches on that size of presentation. Behind a dodger, uh, that's going to impart a lot of action. Six inch or four inch dodger, these sling blades move around a lot, puts a lot of whip on these lures. And they also have uh, color, sound, and vibration there in imparting on themselves. That's why you can go ahead and put that out to about a 13 or 14 inch liter. As I dial it down even tighter and I want to have more whip, more action, um, choose Dodgers that have a lot of kick. And uh, you know, for me, gold is a standard, the old gold standard. I will always run gold. If I'm running three or four rods, one of them will always have gold on them. Doesn't matter if it's first daylight or not. I put the moon jelly on those gold uh, uh, Dodgers and I'm gonna start off the morning with at least one of those. And oddly enough, even in low light conditions, first daylight, even evening light, cloudy days, Gold tends to get it done all the time at some point in the day, so always run. Uh, one, of your, one of your presentations with gold. This one here, as you can see, I actually have a small uh, triple odd or double odd gold blade on this um, LP squid covered uh, uh, lure, along with the gold dodger, gold blade, uh, short leader eight to nine inches that provides a lot of action from that dodger that's going to move around a lot and put a lot of whip on this thing that really gives it a lot of action again i probably wouldn't run this dodger with a wiggle hoochie because i don't need a dodger that's moving that much to whip that thing around now this this case here that short leader that dodger those colors it's going to get it done for me pretty much all day i'm going to run that rig consistently until it gets bit or they ignore it for the entire day but seldom is that combination ever ignored for an entire day so attraction flash UV glow different colors oranges pinks uh, the colors and contrast glow UV um, and uh, the different strands that we put into our lures. It's all about attractability, flash, and drawing their attention. But you know what? They're scent junkies too, and we have to use some form of bait. For me, the Potsky Fire Corn uh, is a fantastic choice. It's been cooked, it's been, um, it's been jarred under pressure, and it's been colored. The color doesn't fade. The durability of the corn will last time and time again. Even if, when fish hit your lure, they tend not to knock the corn off. It's not like buying grocery store canned corn that's soft, adding color and scent to it, putting it on your hooks. Fish will hit it and knock your bait off if they don't get hooked up, okay? With this corn, it's a little firmer. It actually goes on the hook, stays there. Uh, the color doesn't fade and it holds a tremendous amount of scent. And for me, I take, I mostly will fish pink. Uh, or the dark red, uh, or the natural is a great choice as well. They make green, they make purple, but for me, it comes down to pink, the dark red, mostly, and of course, the natural color, which is more of a white that I didn't have any of, but you have to just trust me on that. I just simply take the Potsy's corn, and with the options of the Mike's oils and scents that we have available now, because Potsky's and Mike's is, uh, for the last uh, couple years now, is one company. So uh, mix and match, and utilize the scents that you find in the Mike's products, and by simply taking a bottle of Mike's and a jar of corn, you open this up, pull a little bit of the corn off the top and squirt in a good amount of this oil and just let it sit. And I'll do that a couple months before the season even starts, allowing the corn to absorb that oil and that scent. Typically it doesn't change the color that much at all, if any. Most of these colors in here have no effect on the color of the corn. I've even put blue uh, herring oil in the pink corn. Has no effect on the color, but it adds a tremendous amount of scent. And uh, 
any and all these scents. I've literally caught kokanee on every one of them. We have shrimp and krill. We have earthworm, believe it or not. Kokanee will eat nightcrawler or earthworm, and the earthworm scent of Mike's is the most natural earthworm scent that I have found. Um, herring, yes. Crayfish, absolutely works. Smells very fishy. Kokanee respond to it. Um, of course, we got the anna shrimp. Kokanee, the actual kokanee scent, it smells more like a very sweet, almost vanilla type of scent. Um, early mornings and early season, sometimes the kokanee really respond to something more sweet. This Mike's kokanee scent is one you need to have in your arsenal. And of course, tuna and tuna garlic. Tuna garlic is a great combination and probably my top two that I go to and fish uh, mixed in together as far as one piece of corn on one hook and the other piece on the other, or or I'll run one rig solely with tuna garlic and shrimp anise, okay? Tuna garlic on one rod, shrimp anise on the other, and or a piece of corn out of each jar, one on one hook, one on the other. And what do I mean by that? Basically, when we're putting corn on your lure, remember that you want your lures to continue to function the way they're supposed to function. So I'll just show you on this wiggle hoochie because I can have the bare hook showing. I'm not going to overload my lures with corn. I simply take it, I'll put on one piece on the top hook, and we're going to grab another piece of oil coated corn, and I'm going to put that on the second hook. And that's it. Slide your lure down, whatever presentation you may be using, and drag that through the water. We have scent, we have color. It definitely leaves scent, uh, scent trail in the water. Um, whatever it is or oil that I've put on here, this is, uh, what did I put on here? Oh, shrimp anise, okay? Shrimp anise is what this hoochie uh, smells like. Actually, on these wiggle hoochies, I can even smear a little bit of scent on this bill because it's not going to affect the performance of the lure. Now, something a few guys do, but it seems like not many will do in this. I'm an advocate of this each and every time I'm out. I will definitely take my Dodgers and I will put scent on the back. I'll set this here so you can see it. I'm going to put some form of scent on the back of this Dodger. It's all about color contrast, flash, UV, glow, attractability, noise, disturbance in the water, all the things that we do in scent. And I want to leave a scent trail that they're going to want to follow. And how do I do that? Uh, I've used different gels over the time. Potsky's finally came out with their new gel scents. And I'm here to tell you, like this shrimp scent is a definite go-to. They have tuna. They have uh, a variety of flavors and colors that you can choose from. Shrimp is a very good one that I will use. I literally take some of this gel, okay, because I want it to stay on. If I put an oil on here, it'll stay for a while, but it, over time, it's going to simply wash off, and I got to keep reapplying. If I take this this uh, thicker uh, paste from uh, Potsky's now, I can smear that on the back of my Dodger. Okay, that's going to stay for quite a long time. The other thing I can do if I want to mix and match or make this smell a little bit different than just shrimp, I can take uh, the sweetness of this kokanee glow sand, the oil now, and put a little bit of that on there. And all I'm doing is mixing it in to the gel scent, which it holds it on there. It'll stay on there for a longer, uh, you know, a longer duration. But also with that oil on there, not just the gel, the oil is releasing off of the Dodger, laying out that scent trail. And the gel that stays intact stays and holds on to the Dodger even longer. So for me, it's a combination of gels and oils that's going to go ahead and keep the scent on the Dodger and provide a really good scent trail behind you as you continue to troll across the lake. So uh, mixing and matching scents, use your gel use your oils, put a scent trail out there that they're definitely one going to follow, and keep track of it. Fish one rod with certain scents, fish the other rod with other scents, keep track of time of day, cloud cover or sun, depth that you're getting the fish at, keep track of all that stuff, especially if it's a new piece of water, because I guarantee you when you go back the very next day, none of it's going to work because it's kokanee fish. So you're going to have to figure it all out again. But you do, over time, develop patterns Oops, that will, oops, trying to wipe my hands off here, that will, uh, in fact, 
pr prove results over the course of time. So they're finicky, they're frustrating, but they're so fun to try to figure out. Mix and match, use your colors, use your scents, use your oils, uh, get some of this new Potsky gel scent. You're not gonna be disappointed. It's well worth putting on your Dodger. Don't be afraid to do so, and then simply wash them up when you're done for the day. Okay, that should do it uh, for the Bait Lab. I think we covered enough stuff. If you have questions, hit us up on Facebook. Uh, hit us up on Messenger. Uh, we're here to answer your questions or confusion that we've created. Uh, Tommy's over there just rolling his eyes because he has no idea what any of this is other than we must be going out to catch bait for halibut. So uh, if that's the goal, great. All right, we're going to jump out for a quick break. We come back. We're going to close out the show with Matt Messing. You think you know a thing or two about fishing live bait for ling cod? Well, Matt's taking it up a notch. We're going to get to the bottom of this crazy idea he's got going in Puget Sound when we come back after this break right here on FHM. Chin. Marine is the one-stop shop for the Pacific Northwest Angler. Whether you are looking for a small skiff to fish the sound or rivers or a huge offshore tuna machine, Defiance Marine has it. At Defiance Marine, be sure to power your boat with a Honda Outboard Package. Take advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty on your Honda Outboards. Our service department is always here to help and serve you as the customer. Did you know Defiance Marine has boat financing experts to help get you the best term rates on your new boat purchase? If you need financing for that new boat, call us today. We guarantee the best price, best service on a repower for your current boat. Defiance Marine is a Honda Premier dealership and one of the largest on the West Coast. Defiance Marine also carries all the gear that you will need. Everything from auxiliary kicker motors to fishing tackle and bait. Defiance Marine has certified technicians that are top-notch at their job. Some of the best in the Pacific Northwest at evaluating your boat issues and problems. Stop in today or give us a call for all your needs at Defiance Marine. At Metal Supermarkets, we understand your need for fast access to a wide variety of metals. So we've made it easy. Our network of stores carries a wide variety of metal in all different types, shapes, sizes, and grades, with no required minimum order size. Who could ask for more? Simply tell us your dimensions online, on the phone, or in store, and we'll cut or process the metal to your desired size, often while you wait. We offer same-day service and can deliver the metal right to your door or job site. We even source hard-to-find metals, so no matter what you're looking for, metal supermarkets can provide it for you. And we're conveniently located with brick-and-mortar stores in Seattle and Portland, so you can check out our extensive stock for yourself. Superior customer service is guaranteed. Quality service from real people who know metal. We are the small quantity metal experts. To place an order, simply call a store to talk to one of our knowledgeable customer service representatives, fill out a quote request online, order off of our e-commerce website, or visit one of our many locations and pick out the metal you want. Whether you're a small or large business, government, homeowner, or hobbyist, we make it easy for you to buy the exact metal and just the amount you need. We've been doing this for over 30 years, so we know how to get it done. Metal Supermarkets, the convenience stores for metal. Visit or call a Metal Supermarket store near you today. What if there was a smarter way to search for your new home? Introducing the Better Homes and Gardens real estate website and mobile app. This revolutionary new search tool puts your needs first. Narrow your search to what matters most to your family like school data, school districts, and even walk scores. Get easy access to your local affiliated agent, as well as unique and local insights about neighborhoods and properties directly within the app. With sync and safe preferences, you'll always pick up wherever you left off. Get your smarter search started today with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Welcome back in studio. Josh just reminded me I should probably be calling Matt. 
Uh, Not a bad idea. See if he's available. Hey, hey. Hey, you answered on the first ring. Perfect, because we're already back live, and I forgot to call you. <laughs> yeah, we, I know. We were watching. I'm he's like, watching the show. He's like, oh, he's probably going <laughs> to. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, before we jump into this stuff, a couple, uh, couple things that came up here. Uh, great to see a handful of you guys are using those Eagle Claw Raws. Great, great uh, investment. Uh, James, yeah, you got four on your boat. I don't blame you. Those things uh, are fantastic. Where can you buy those? Those Abu Reels, I think Tommy's answering that one. Uh, yeah. Pretty much anywhere at your local sporting goods stores. If you're here around, you know this area, west side of Washington, or have a opportunity to venture on through uh, Five Stop at Sportco, ask for the beard at the uh, fishing counter. He'll hook you up with the uh, best deals on the Abus that they have. Uh, lots of great opportunity, and um, some of our folks are saying or implying that they're they've done just fine catching kokanee without any sand or bait. Hey, that's fantastic too. I mean, if that's working for you, just stick with it. I've always found that. Uh, Bait definitely makes a difference in scent for kokanee for where I'm fishing definitely makes a uh, a big uh, a big uh, change or opportunity. So uh, with that, Matt Messing, long time no talk, man. As far as being on the show, how you been? Yeah, doing good, man. Just you know, surviving this COVID nineteen pandemic. You got it. Messing around fishing charters, and uh, now that uh, I'm sure you caught the first part of the show, when we were talking with Mark Coleman, and he uh, went ahead and let out if you hadn't heard or got the message today that uh, for somebody like you that's chartering in Puget Sound, you should be able to start doing these uh, lingcod and and bottom fish trips uh, with two persons from the same family on board your boat. Yeah, it's exciting. We uh, finally get to go back to work again. How about but, that? Yeah, yeah. Even though it's limited. Yes. It'd be nice to see the ocean opening up too soon, though. That'd be great. Amen. Yeah, Amen. You know? we hear you there. My partner's uh, waiting yeah. and waiting and waiting and <laughs> not ready to move to Florida if he doesn't get his opportunity. My, so. my blood pressure is right. all-time high. Uh, <laughs> speaking of which, both of us are looking forward to heading north uh, on Saturday morning to meet up with you. We're going to go out on Puget Sound and chase around for some lingcod, which is going to be a heck of a lot of fun. But uh, you've kind of upped the ante a little bit this last week as we were talking, and you got a little aggressive with your whole live bait deal sand dabs yeah sand dabs will work but not good enough for matt tommy he decided these uh pile perch look a little shiny yeah, they do. and inviting and yeah, i don't have time to catch them at uh four in the morning before i head out so give me an idea what you got going on matt with these pile perch and uh what's your new program yeah so i decided to uh step my bait game up here a little bit for these link odd and made myself a nice little live pen that uh, i can keep here next to the boat yeah, so we just uh, yeah we go out in the evenings here, and I just you know get a couple hours here and there, and fish a bunch up and throw them in there, so I can just come in here in the morning, scoop them up, and toss them in the bait tank and go. Uh, how do you catch them? How are you catching them? Yeah, we're just uh, using sabiki rigs. Okay, are you, yeah, bait, are you dip, tipping them with bait at all, or just straight sabiki rig? Just straight sabiki rigs, just a little fish skin, like about that size eight, little tiny hooks. Yeah. Yeah, and they just, I, I cut them in half because some of them come with like seven or six hooks or something like that. We just cut them in half and put them on a couple of rods and go for it. Huh? Right on, and you're just catching them right next to the dock, huh? next to some pilings? Uh, yeah, just right here in Brunswick Marina. It's fully loaded and bait with bait right now. It's great. They That's are awesome. all over the place. So yeah, it's, it's right around the corner from the boathouse here. I just go out there and fill a bucket up and we just kind of take turns of running back and forth down the dock, dumping the buckets into the bait pen. Right on. That, was, you know, that reminds me when I was a kid. You know, yeah. we used to go down to the dock, and we'd fish before we went fishing. Right. And I would catch those shiner perch. And what I would do is I would go and, you know, it wasn't as fancy as a sabiki rig. Right? Sure. My parents gave me a couple, you know, number eight, number 10, 12 hooks. And I would just grab the muscles off the dock, and I'd crack them, and I'd yep. tip, put a little bait on the hook throw it over yep. and we get we get these guys all day long yeah 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 so uh what'd you get your link caught on today uh shiner Nice. Got him on a little perch. <laughs> yeah, nice. Inhaled them. That's inhaled perfect. Them. And uh, we put a picture up. Josh put a picture up. Some of the photos you sent me. You're just lip hooking them buggers and sending them down, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. I just uh, I'm going right up through the nose with a with an octopus or a circle hook, and uh, yeah, just dropping them down. I've been using a six ounce, yeah, six ounce lead. Yeah. Have you tried any other hooks on that bait to get a different swimming action? You know, like for tuna, sometimes we'll butt hook them, make them go down, or we'll put them in the in the in their shoulder, make them swim up a little bit. Have you experimented with that yet, or are we going to do that Saturday? 
We'll, we'll do some stuff Saturday. Some of yeah. these herring, I, I think they'll do a little bit better if you're hooking them right behind the dorsal, right on the back there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that'll. I think they'll just dive right down and be wiggling all over the place. Six ounces of weight. How much? Uh, how de- deep of water are you fishing? Uh, what are we kidding? Today it was like 35 feet. Oh, perfect. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Tommy awesome. can do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll make sure I bring my electric reel. Nah. Yeah. Six oh, ounces yeah. at 30 <laughs> feet of water. <laughs> Love it. I don't want to strain my we'll shoulder. Just, we'll just whip them up out of the boat. Yeah, right perfect. <laughs> well, uh, hey, man, really looking forward to getting out with you. Um, should be a good time. Weather looks to be pretty decent. And uh, I'll give you a shout tomorrow, figure out where we're going to meet up there around Shoal Shoal area. But, uh, yeah, going to be great. We're trying to get some of this on video so we can share it with folks next week and uh, we'll show them exactly how we're hooking up these uh, live baits and swimming them on down and some different things we're going to try. Uh, pretty excited. I know Tommy's excited. We're looking I'm forward to this. I'm, yeah. I'm curious how you're yeah. using your electronics to find these link out holes or, you know, kind of, kind of what do you see on the screen when you drift over these different spots? Uh, I'm, I'm getting a lot of marks. I'm finding some nice little pinnacles down there. And, uh, you know, I've got the Raymarine Axiom Pro on the boat. It's with a nice air mark. Transducer out there. So, so I get to, I, I can see a lot down there. I get some pretty good definition. Perfect. Beautiful. Well, yeah. uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to start booking trips, seeing as how now you can get back to fishing. So we want to make sure people will be able to find you. Uh, Matt Messing, messing around, fishing charters. Locate them on Facebook. Go to your website. Um, throw your phone number out there for people to call you and book a trip. What do you want to do? Yeah, 360-621-2681. Uh, let's go fish, catch some live bait, and have a blast. Perfect. Sounds good you know, to me. And the, and the thing yeah. that we are, we're totally under talking the whole live bait thing. I mean, it is a totally different feeling when in your fingertips, you yeah. can feel that live bait in your hand when you're touching the line mm-hmm. and you can literally feel it. The second that link cut opens his mouth and inhales the entire bait, you feel that wrap. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the bait grows like, you know, yeah. mighty mouse and takes on. Right. And you feed them. Yeah. And then Everything you, just gets heavy. It Can't wait. Heavy, you know, I mean, you're running circle hooks, right? And so that, yeah. that fish has a chance to take the bait, inhale it, and slowly turn and swim away. And that circle hook will see you right in the corner of his mouth. You know, what we need to do is put one of them Wolfie inline cameras about three feet above yeah. that bait. And yeah. then watch that link cod come after that live swimming it. bait. So yeah. uh, I think we may have to try to rig that up. So, all right, Matt, we're going to jump out of here. We're uh, running a little bit late tonight. Thanks for uh, hanging in there waiting for us. And uh, I remember to call you. So that's a good thing. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, you remember the phone number. Cool. <laughs> yeah, you got it, buddy. Well, always a pleasure. Looking forward to getting out on the boat with you Saturday and uh, bring your A game because Tommy and I are ready. Right on. See you guys Saturday. All right, buddy. Have a good night. All right. Later. All right, Matt Messing, messing around fishing charters. He's got his program dialed. And as we roll into salmon season, if you haven't booked with the charter yet, make sure you look Matt up. He's always out there, Area 10, dips his uh, area up into Area 9, gets it done. Guy's always got fish on board. Great uh, guy to hang out with. You're going to have a lot of fun, so make sure you give him a call. All right, Tommy, that's going to do it for us for a few minutes over, but we typically are, so... Whatever. <laughs> That's what we do. So much information. Yeah, a lot of stuff to get through. Appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. Had a good showing, lots of good questions, comments. Hey, if you got things that come up during the week, and I know you do, uh, whether you're out on the water yourself or traipsing around the woods still trying to find that uh, kind of mid to late season gobbler, post those picks up on our Facebook page. Hit us up on Messenger with your questions, with your success stories. Uh, give us those pictures on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, we want to be part of your week as you are. With with ours and we will continue to dig up more information throughout the week as it unfolds always bringing you relevant information that uh, you can hopefully use so have a great week stay safe i'm not gonna tell people to wash your hands because everybody's doing that already yeah. so uh. get tight stay tight stay hooked up there you go stay hooked up tommy Dolan. i'm gonna put that on a shirt yeah. fhn stay hooked up all right you guys have a great week we will see you right here next thursday right here on fhn